So keep your Bibles turned there to Jonah chapter 3. Thank you, Keegan, for reading that so well. And uh, it's great. Everyone's rested this morning. Um, if we're going to have a time change, and maybe someday we won't, but I like the time change in the fall. Um, it's a little better than the one in the spring. At least uh, you get that extra hour. So this morning I was able to get up and get my cup of coffee at 7 o'clock, and it was bright and light. So uh, I'm expecting everyone to stay awake this morning. So this is good. So this morning we continue our study in the book of Jonah, and, and what a fascinating book it is. And as Darcy's already pointed out to us a number of times, the story of Jonah is so connected with the whale, it's kind of the elephant in the room, um, that the rest of the story often gets missed. That's kind of where it gets stuck in the whale's throat. But the bigger story is really about Jonah himself, the prophet who ran the other direction when given his mission to preach to the people of Nineveh. And the biggest story is about the patience and compassion of God. His patience and compassion for the worst of sinners, the Ninevites, who were a violent and miserable people. And it's the patience and compassion of God for the best of sinners, this prodigal prophet called Jonah. Tim Keller in his book, his commentary, subtitles his commentary, Jonah and the Mystery of God's Mercy. Mercy to a disobedient prophet and mercy to undeserving Ninevites. Ninevites were those deadly enemies of God's people, otherwise known as the Assyrians. So if you have a Bible, let's turn to Jonah again. And I'm going to go right back to the, to the beginning, just briefly. Jonah chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come before me. Now turn over to Jonah 3 and verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. I don't know if any of you remember the TV film series, Mission Impossible. Do you remember that? And it would begin with this phrase, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is. And then would follow a command that would make even the bravest man shake and dread and fear. Now, in Noah's case, I don't think he was actually given a choice to accept a mission. But even without a choice, he rejected it. However, as you have learned, that didn't go so well. And here he is in chapter 3, back at the beginning. He's done a full circle. He's right back where he started. And the command comes a second time. So here he goes again. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. And what is the mission? Jonah 3, verse 2. Arise and go to Nineveh. So this time it says, verse 3, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Nineveh was over a thousand kilometers uh, from, from Israel. It was uh, over desert and, and over territory. And, and we could call this Jonah Mission 2.0. So 1.0 didn't quite work. Here goes 2.0. What's going to happen this time? The question I guess I have is why was, no, uh, why was Jonah so resistant to take the message of the Lord to Nineveh? Was it due to the fact of that incredibly long journey, 1,200 kilometers across hostile territory? I don't really think that was the issue. Was it due to fear? No, that's a reasonable concern. The Assyrians, as we found out, were known for the brutality, horrible brutality. They were the first of the terror states, and they terrorized all they came in contact with. They were known for the brutality. They were unlikely to act kindly to this foreign preacher coming from Israel telling these proud Ninevites to change their ways. Somebody has, I think it was Keller actually, compares Jonah's situation to that of a Jewish rabbi in 1939 who would decide to stand on the steps of the Reichstag, the parliament of the Nazi Germans in Berlin, and call on Hitler and the Nazis to repent. Now, I have a feeling that wouldn't have ended too well for the rabbi. And although fear may have been involved, it seems to me there's a much bigger issue in Jonah's prodigal behavior. We might call it Jonah's dilemma. Jonah had two opposing convictions that were tugging at his heart at the same time. First was the conviction of the patriot, 
national pride for his country, Israel. He was a citizen of Israel. More than that, he was an advisor and encourager to the king, King Jeroboam II. And we only come across Jonah one other occasion in the Old Testament. Why don't we turn there? It's in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And this tells us a little bit about Jonah and his heart. 1 Kings 14, verse 25. 25. He, that is Jeroboam II, who was an evil king, restored the border of Israel from Leboth Hamath. That's way up in the north of Lebanon, so a few hundred kilometers north of Israel. He restored the border from Leboth Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea. According to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. So Jonah loved his country, and even under the reign of an evil king, he prophesied the expansion of that country, and it came to pass. Jonah loved his country, and he wanted it to prosper, much in the same way that we love Canada, and we want to see it prosper. And more more than that, with good cause, Jonah believed that Israel was special in God's eyes, and there's lots of biblical basis for that. He believed that the Jews were a chosen people, a holy nation. Therefore, to be an enemy of Israel was to be an enemy of his. And more than that, to be an enemy of Israel was to be an enemy of God. Or that's what Jonah thought. Do you see the dilemma? Assyria, Nineveh, the superpower of the ancient world, is the deadly enemy of Israel. And a brutal enemy Nineveh was. Defeating and destroying nations, torturing and displacing peoples. And at least two prior occasions, Assyria had threatened to wipe Israel off the map. And in 722 BC, Assyria would do exactly that, and the northern kingdom of Israel would be destroyed. And Jonah had a conviction that an enemy of Israel's was an enemy of his. And with a passion, he disdained the enemies of Israel. Therefore, he disdained, may I say, he hated the Assyrians. And we'll learn a little more about that next week as... uh, as Dustin continues on into chapter 4. That was Jonah the Patriot. But there's a second conviction. conviction. Not only Jonah the Patriot, but Jonah was also the Lord's prophet. He was committed to proclaiming the word of the Lord, faithfully, fully, and honestly to all who would believe. To do otherwise would make him a false prophet, and that was not what Jonah wanted. So these two convictions were coming into conflict, the patriot of Israel who wants to see his nation prosper and the prophet of the Lord. Perhaps this deep tension helps us better understand Jonah's response. It helps us understand why he went west to Tarshish when he was supposed to go east to Nineveh and why, as we discover next week, he was angry when the people of Nineveh actually listened and responded to his message. So with good reason, he believed that the saving of Nineveh could mean the destruction of Israel. Now, in my work, we sometimes use things called algorithms, and you folks who are involved in tech use those a lot more than I do, but they're really a series of choices, a series of pathways which help you to make a decision. So I think I got the one up there, which is a simplified one of one we use almost every day. So this is where you have an individual who's had trauma to their neck. They've had an injury. And so we follow through a little flowchart on what we should do so as to keep everyone happy, from legal to government and everyone else, and the patient, uh, that we're doing the right thing. So we go through a flowchart and we say, are there any high-risk factors here in this person? They're, They're stable, they're standing up, they're talking to me, but they're more than 65 years old, they've had a dangerous mechanism of injury, they've rolled over their car, or as what happens around our work, they've rolled over their buggy. Um, That happened just a little while ago. They've got numbness down their arms. And so if that is the case, then pathway says, yes, need some x-rays done. Make sure they haven't fractured their neck. But if that hasn't happened, now we follow a second pathway. No, that hasn't happened. It was a low-risk accident. It was a low, they didn't roll their buggy. They just bumped into another one. They're able to rotate their neck at least 45 degrees. And if that's the case of what the patient's all about, then they don't need any x-rays. But... If they're not able to turn their neck 45 degrees, only 20 degrees, then it goes the other direction and they need a radiograph. Anyhow, that's... I wonder if Jonah was following an algorithm when he made this decision in Jonah chapter 1. So the word of the Lord comes 
Go and tell, oh, you got it all up there, so you're all in good shape. Go and tell Nineveh to repent. Okay, pathway number one, I'll obey and go. Response A, Nineveh will reject the message and will be destroyed. Response B, Nineveh will listen and will be preserved. Okay, pathway two, run the other direction, and for sure Nineveh is destroyed. There's no possibility of that second bubble. So Jonah thought about it. He didn't think about it for very long, but he thought about it. So the mission to, to Nineveh would probably be unsuccessful. He'll probably end up here with Nineveh destroyed. But there's this little eeny teeny possibility, a one out of a hundred, kind of like Trump getting elected, a one out of a hundred thing that might happen. Nineveh may be saved. He thinks, oh, okay, I've got another way to go. If I disobey, run the other way. Nineveh is destroyed. There's no other option. And so what does he do? It's just way too big a risk to do this one. I'm going the other way. If God is going to save Nineveh, I want nothing to do with it, says Jonah. But you know the rest of the story. It did not end well. So God in his mercy, though, offers this second chance. He brings him back by the uber whale, and now he's got to try it all over again. But his battling convictions have caused this great dilemma, the patriot and the prophet. Okay, let's continue the story. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3 and 4. Jonah continues, Yet forty days, he says, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now Nineveh is an exceeding great city, three days' journey and breadth. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is Jonah's message, or more correctly, the message he had been given. It was very simple, it was very straightforward, it was very direct, it was right to the point. It was unmistakable. It was a message of warning, a message of imminent danger. The red lights are flashing, the alarm bells are ringing. Forty days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Now, did Jonah say more than that? I suppose he did. Preachers usually have a way of saying a few extra things. You ever, you know, the preachers are getting in, I have a, just one more thing to say. And you think, that took you 15 minutes, that one more thing. Just be glad he didn't have three more things to say. And I would imagine prophets were like that too. They had a few things to say. I forgot to say, young citizens should leave. There they go. <laughs> they did it on their own, right? Perhaps he had a few other things to say. I think he did. He probably shone a light on their evil. He probably railed at their violence. He may have grown angry at their injustice. A hundred years later, the prophet Nahum would also prophesy against Nineveh. And this time, the prophecy would come to fruition. And in 612 BC, Nineveh was destroyed. Turn over to Nahum, and let's read those words. Nahum chapter 3, just a few pages ahead in your Bible. And Nahum the prophet, he has some harsh words for Nineveh. I wonder if Jonah might have used words like this as well. Nahum 3 verse 1, Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey, the crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, Horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear. That's what's going to happen to you guys. Hosts of slain, heaps of corpuses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. Look at verse 7. And all who look at you, Nineveh, will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will grieve for her? Where shall her comforters be? Look over to verse 18. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. Your people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There's no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not come your unceasing evil? Well, I don't know if Jonah preached like this or not. But there's one thing I do know for sure. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And from all we can tell, Jonah did not want a positive response for his message. And that certainly is an odd approach. Can you imagine Darcy at the end of giving an impassioned message, and then he says, I hope none of you guys listen to me. I, I, you know, and that's, that's really strange. There's nothing like that in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It appears that Jonah would have been quite content, in fact, overjoyed, if his message was ignored and no one responded. 
He'd have been quite content if they'd have sent that Hebrew prophet a thousand kilometers back to Israel, never to see him again. But that is not God's way. And we do well to remember that the message is always bigger than the messenger. You know, when you come across stories of Christian preachers who have behaved in very questionable ways or abominable ways, always remember this. The message is always bigger than the messenger. Messengers are failing, disappointing, sometimes embarrassing, but the message remains the same. And in the New Testament, we hear the message loud and clear. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4, God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The message is clear. God's mercy is extended to all. But, someone may say, was that true in the Old Testament as well? Wasn't it different back then? Well, turn in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 18, and let's see what it was like in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 18, verse 7 and 8. And this is the story of when Jeremiah goes to the potter's house. But I'll pick up the story in verse 7. And Jeremiah writes, If at any time I declare, says the Lord, concerning a nation or a kingdom, that I will pluck it up and break it down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I intended to do to it. Then the prophet continues with the opposite. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build it and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. The message is the same, Old Testament or New Testament. So even if Jonah's message was given with a hard heart, the message was much bigger than the messenger, and the call to repentance was genuine and valid. This was Jonah's message. Forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So, how do the people respond? Let's continue in Jonah chapter 3 and beginning at verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Look at verse 8. The king said, let... But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God and let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. So how did the people of Nineveh respond? The response is beyond incredible. They listened with open ears. They believed freely en masse. You know, it's the whole, you know, it's interesting how a whole society can change, isn't it? I, I would never have really believed that you guys would all stick on masks so quick. We did, because we kind of knew it was the right thing to do. And, and they believed, and freely and en masse, they changed their way. They did something they could never have imagined. I mean, if someone had told you this a year ago, you'd have had a good laugh. They acknowledged their evil, and they renounced their violence. And from the bottom up and the top down, they demonstrated their contrition. They fasted. They didn't have any food or water. They put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth was a rough kind of clothing that was made of goat's hair that was what slaves wore or that people wore as a sign of mourning and contrition. And even the king is involved in all this. Uh, Jonah 3, verse 6, the word reaches the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the dirt, sat in the ashes. In a nutshell, the entire city repented. There isn't another story like this in the whole Bible that I'm aware of. There is the story of the revival in Israel at the time of King Josiah and also of King Hezekiah, when the people find the word of God and they re-celebrate the Passover and they have a great party. And there's the renewal and revival in the time of Ezra, when the people listened to the reading of God's word, and it's said that they confessed their sin and they wept bitterly. But that was a story of revival among God's people. The story of Nineveh is a story of revival, repentance of a foreign, idolatrous, pagan people. Now, scholars have asked the question, why did the people of Nineveh so quickly respond to the message? And it's been pointed out, that this era in Assyria's history and Nineveh's history was a time of instability 
and insecurity. Previous to this, Nineveh had been very powerful, and a few years later on under Sennacherib, they'd be very powerful again. But this was a time of instability. They'd gone through different kings and leaders, and the situation was unstable. It's been pointed out that at this time, northern tribes had been successfully attacking the frontiers of Assyria, and actually Nineveh and the armies of Assyria had lost a number of battles. The threat of invasion was very real. Nineveh was going through a time it had never experienced before. It had never been threatened by another power. Some scholars say that around that time, about 762 BC, there was a massive solar eclipse which lasted for an extended period of time and is actually recorded in the annals of Assyrian history. It was supposedly a sign in the heavens of danger. And, this will make us feel right at home, there had been a major famine, but there had reportedly also been a major pandemic that had occurred through the empire at that point in time. So this was a time of uncertainty in Nineveh, and perhaps that prepared the people's hearts. Perhaps it made them open to Jonah's message. Now these signs may have prepared the way, but they didn't change the people's hearts. What changed the people? It's really straightforward. They heard and they believed God's word. Did you get that? That's what changed them. They heard and they believed God's word, and that's still what changes people's hearts. That's still what changes our heart. There's a power in the timeless message of God's word. The writer of Hebrews describes God's word as sharper than a two-edged sword. It can cut deep. It exposes our sin, and it points us to the Savior. So, there's Jonah's mission. There's Nineveh's repentance. Now, there's one final part to the story. Read Jonah 3, verse 10. Here's the third part. It's actually the most important part of all. When God saw what they did how they turned from their evil way, God relented. Remember Jeremiah 18? God relented of the disaster that he'd said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Jonah's mission, Nineveh's repentance, but beyond it all is God's mercy. Withholding the judgment that the Ninevites so richly deserved, and did Jonah ever believe they richly deserved it? This was a people that practiced injustice. Here was a nation that promoted torture, this was a city who was known for their violence and for their evil. And yet, much to the anger of Jonah, God gives them mercy. Our God is the God of the second chance. He granted a second chance to the disobedient prophet. And now he gives a second chance to this violent city. But I want you to notice something really important here in this passage. Yeah, I think it's, it's critical that even though his mercy was undeserved, it was not unconditional. Now, what do I mean when I say that, that his mercy was undeserved, but his forgiveness was not unconditional? Look at Jonah 3, verse 10. When God saw, saw what they did, his mercy was connected with the response of the Ninevites, what they did. Well, what did they do? Well, they acknowledged their wrong. Their evil, their violence, all covered by a big three-letter word in the Bible called sin. They acknowledged their sin. They admitted that they had gone wrong. They made no excuses. They made no explanations. Just the plain facts, we are wrong. But they did more than that. They gave evidence that they were wrong by their actions. They put on this sackcloth and ashes. Now, they were nothing in and off themselves, and sometimes in the Old Testament, people did this as a bit of a holy show. But this was not a holy show. They were serious, and this was evidence of their sincerity. But more than that, they more than just acknowledged their sin, Jonah 3 verse 10 says they turned from their evil. In other words, they changed their behavior. They acknowledged their wrongdoing, and they changed. This is true Repentance. This is the response of a guilty heart. And God, in his grace, forgives. He gives them undeserved mercy. Jonah 3, verse 10, God relented of the disaster he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let me close with this. God's principles of forgiveness have not changed. As Christians, we understand the cross makes all the difference. But when we acknowledge our sin and our wrongdoing, and without excuse, we humbly turn around. We are granted forgiveness through Christ. But there's a big, big biblical principle. Without full repentance, there cannot be 
full forgiveness. Did you get that? Without full repentance, there can't be full forgiveness. And having been forgiven as believers, we freely forgive others. Now, in closing, let me just leave you with four takeaways. Here's the first one. No one is beyond God's mercy. No individual, no community, no country. Sometimes we're tempted to believe, and when we see things in our own society, we think change can never come. Well, remember the story of Nineveh. Number two, God cares for cities, even big, sprawling, noisy, decadent cities. As the city goes, often so goes the country. Cities are the center of culture. They're the center of power. And God cares for cities, and we must too. Number three, God's word is powerful. The preaching of Christ brought renewal and revival down through the years of church history, and it can still change lives today. Change lives in the Old Testament can change lives today. And as a church, we want to listen to and be formed by God's word. Here's number four. The principle of forgiveness is for all. When a guilty heart acknowledges their sin and turns to Christ, they experience God's forgiveness. And that principle applies in my life. When someone has deeply hurt me, when they apologize and they ask for my forgiveness, I forgive. I want to close with a reading here that comes from a great theological journal, the Kitchener Record. <laughs> and this was an editorial from the September 22nd uh, record, the Waterloo Regional Record of this year. Could you find it in yourself to forgive someone whose careless actions claim the life of a person you loved? And, and this story is from our own community, and I, I think it can encourage us. This is our, many of us, this is our background. In my case, it's through my wife. Some of you, it's directly. And, and I think this is such an encouraging story of God's grace and forgiveness in our community. This question of could you forgive someone who caused real hurt to you is far from being a theoretical puzzle. The question was all too painfully real for the family of Daniel Martin, <clears throat> a 46-year-old Elmira man, or more correct, a West Monroe man, who was killed by a Cambridge truck driver driving too fast and paying too little attention to the road on February 6, 2019. The loss to the Martins family was incalculable. He left behind a wife and seven children. And considering he'd be alive today if that truck driver had behaved more cautiously, it's easy to think that Martin's grieving family would feel anger towards that individual and demand the stiffest possible punishment, likely one that would include time behind bars. But that's not how the Martins reacted. In a moving victim statement read out in the Kitchener court on that Monday, which would be September the 19th, the family wholeheartedly forgave him. Even more, they asked the judge to spare the driver from jail, a request that the judge took into account before issuing his sentence. To Martin's family, this act of forgiveness may have seemed a natural expression of their deep Christian faith. But in a world where bitter condemnations and cries for vengeance too often drown out the quieter, more reasoned calls for mercy, the wisdom of this old order family warrants greater attention from all of us because they performed a service for all of us. They said, we want the driver to know that the whole family does not hold anything against him. And if there was some negligence in watching traffic, we forgive him for that. In wounds that were still open, these words provided a healing balm. In the end, the truck driver who pleaded guilty to the charge of careless driving causing death was sentenced to one year probation and a $2,000 fine. He can't drive for the first month, three months of that year, and in the remaining time only to work or medical appointments. Should he have faced harsher consequences? Some will think so. The driver was traveling a little more than 80 kilometers an hour on Northfield Drive and most likely was not paying full attention. The blame for the collision lies with him and him alone. The consequences were a life cut short and a serious violation of the law. Our courts exist to deliver justice, but that means nothing less than doing what is morally fair and right. And that's something no law, no matter how scrupulously written, can perfectly bring about to the satisfaction of all. That takes human hearts. So where does forgiveness come in? The act of ceasing to feel anger or resentment to someone who has harmed you. Well, in cases such as this one, forgiveness is a powerful force that clears a pathway to justice. In this case, the truck driver admitted his mistakes. He expressed sorrow for his actions, and he begged the family for forgiveness. They gave it. 
And while no one can predict the future, we believe the Martins families, their generous act will allow both them and the driver to break free from a tragic past and make a new beginning to their lives. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonder of forgiveness. We thank you for second chances. Second chances for evil Ninevites and second chances for wayward prophets and second chances for us. We're thankful that none of us is beyond your mercy. Precious, precious blood of Jesus shed on Calvary, shed for rebels, shed for sinners, shed for me. Receive our thanks through Jesus Christ. Amen.